Hey everybody, Sean for... No, 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 we'll try it again. And here we go. Hey everybody, it's Sean with the Good Dog with Q&A Saturday, episode number 145. Yes, something like that. I've stopped trying putting, putting up the hand signals because as you've seen, if you watch any of the prior episodes, that was always a struggle. So I'm just gonna offload those. Guys, it's been a hell of a long time. Um, hi, Bug. It's been a hell of a long time. Um, what, year, year and year, year and a half? Year and four months. Year and four months, it's been a long time. Um, and it's been a long time because been focused on a ton of other projects. Um, you know, trying to write the new book, um, putting out the new leashes, getting New Orleans up and running, keeping LA running, um, T3, all the other things going on. And this, even though it might look like we just set up a camera and we just like yap with you guys, is actually far more complicated than what it seems. Um, getting set up, the camera, the gear, the sound, the light, the, all this, and making sure it's all framed right, that all takes time. But going through all the questions, figuring out which are the right questions, which are the best, and then writing them out, writing out notes, making sure we're, we're prepared, all of that ends up taking a whole boatload of time. And so on a weekly basis, it ends up being something that's pretty challenging to uh, tackle weekly. So what we've decided to do is tackle it monthly. And I think that will work. I think we can hold ourselves to that deal, which is basically, this will come out when? The first Saturdays of each month. Ooh, that's that, Now you're holding us to something like really tight. Uh, <laughs> that's what she says. I'm going to say that we're going to do one a month and, uh, and I'm going to cross my fingers that that all goes down uh, uh, appropriately. But this, this episode specifically will come out on the first. So on the first, but also the first Saturday of the month. And exactly. And so, halfway through the year. Okay, I don't know what that means, but what Six I'm... Six months into 2019. Okay, fantastic. So what I'm really excited <laughs> about is that the first one will kick off on the first Saturday of this month um, or this next month, and so it'll have a nice roll to it. If we can stick to it, hell. I'd love to do it. We'll see how it goes. Life gets crazy and travel and all of that stuff gets, gets in the way, so it can be challenging. Anyways, guys, thanks for joining us. Um, I, I, have to, I, I have to be honest and say it's been a nice vacation. Um, it's helped me recharge, but it's also nice to be back and start doing this again because I really love the interactions and I love being able to answer the questions and diving in deep with you guys. And it's just a different, a different way of connecting that we don't get to do with all of our other kind of connections. Anyways, so let's yak as we always do if you're familiar with our older show. Um, what's been cooking and what is cooking? So. One, we're back. That's the first thing on the list. We covered that. Uh, two, uh, the new leashes are finally out and being shipped, which is really great news. Um, anybody who ordered multiple colors ended up having to wait a little bit longer than somebody who might have ordered, well, uh, silver or pink, because those were the only two colors that actually arrived. Um, so uh, anybody who ordered silver, pink, and maybe turquoise, you've had to wait a little bit longer because we didn't have the rest of them because they're all being made by hand. They're all being made lovingly by hand by our good friends at Wet Bijou. Shout out to Sandra and her poor numb fingers. So, um, yeah, leashes are coming out. Uh, I, I should say they're shipping out and we get a new order tomorrow, tomorrow correct? Tomorrow morning. Which means you will be... Blank. Doing... Yeah, okay. Ooh, you got info. Tell me. Black yeah. and navy blue. Oh. And navy blue was my favorite. 
Okay. So I'm excited. Where's the turquoise? It's still hiding out. It's on its way. Yes. It's turquoise in, and red is the last one. They're, they're in transit. Just say they're in transit. It's a good way. Transit. Kind of like, they're, in, they're in transit. Okay, so we've got a couple new ones coming in uh, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so you will probably be doing a whole bunch of packaging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> on Sunday and then shipping on Monday. Monday. Gotcha. Cool. Okay. So new leashes, people are digging them. Uh, and when I say that, he, he, you guys are like, well, they haven't shipped yet. We've sent them out to a lot of folks. We've sent them out like Tori Smith has been using them. Jeff Gelman has been using them. He's already asking about wholesale prices, of course, uh, Jeffrey, and uh, <laughs> always looking for the, for the deal. And um, we've also had the teams uh, in New Orleans and the teams in LA using them and everybody's loving them. And so great news, I'm super excited. This is the leash that we've kind of like in our own ghetto fashion have had to kind of create for extra safety for the dogs we've been working with. And then we decided, well, hell, why don't we put a leash together that bypasses all of this kind of like ramshackle kind of ghetto carabiner thing and actually makes it much easier and much safer and cooler all the way around and so we did and then we decided well heck maybe people would like to buy them and strangely enough we we, we don't even have them on the website yet because we haven't taken full-on pictures of them yet everybody's like where are they on the website they're not on the website because we haven't been able to take pictures and get them in like a really great like visual so you guys can see what you're getting. So we've just done an email pre-order which is like about as ghetto as you can get. And and we've, we've sold a ton of leashes mm -hmm. just through the pre-orders. Um, not just local but around the world. We just got an order in from Australia, Australia. right? So, Shout out to Australia. Shout out to all these. Anyways, um, so that's good news. Let me see if I can keep moving on so we don't uh, drag this out because I'm a little famous for dragging things out. So love them by leading them. Um, the book, the little book that could, the little book that uh, seems to have kind of stormed the beaches of dog training um, is now officially available on Kindle on Amazon. So all of you Kindle users, you can jump on it and read it on your Kindle. I don't have one, so uh, yeah. Uh, but for those of you who do, mom, I'm talking to you. Uh, you can order it finally. Uh, um, hi, mom. Um, the Audible, I just redid some of the uh, bumpers that go in the on the front and back of the Audible recordings for both closing the gap and love them by leaving them. And um, literally two days ago, I think, uh, we were at the studio, uh, Airlift, Airlift Productions with uh, Michael Zients um, doing those. And um, how many takes did I take? Two takes. First one would have worked, but I took two just to like knock it out of the park. Anyways, not bragging, but so put those bumpers on there because Audible is very specific, very particular, very much like it has to say this is how it begins and this is who it's read by and this is how it ends and this was read by and so I went in and did all of that. So Audible uh, versions coming out on Amazon really, really soon and then the paperback will be, of course, strangely enough, the last one to come out on Amazon. Um, we're trying to make it more available for folks mm -hmm. because so many people that want it live far away and then it ends up costing them because it's a heavy book um, and it's an expensive book because we put a lot of dough into it in the production of it, um, ends up being a pretty pricey endeavor for folks um, in different parts of the world. So what we're trying to do is get it on Amazon everywhere so people that are far away can order it for a reasonable price, which, you know, is a, is a good thing. So. Uh, let's see, um, love them by leading them too. We were just discussing that today, um, strategies. I am about two posts or pieces, I did not post, two pieces away from completing it. It's taken me about a year and a half of, um, I won't say daily work, but close to it. Um, as you guys know, when I did love them by leading them, the first one, I took a lot of things that already existed, pieces and um, content that I'd already put out there and then just completely scratched what was there, took the idea and then rewrote the entire thing, uh, updated it, upgraded it and made it 
better. And so that's the same thing that I've done with this. Plus I've wrote some very specific individual um, pieces that are, that are only in this book that won't live anywhere else. So I'm pretty damn excited, mostly because mostly because my proofreader um, who did the first book after it came out the first time with a bunch of typos and errors and then we sent it to a professional to uh, have it helped. Um, Gidget, I'm talking to, uh, Gidget sent me a very, very kind PM a few months back and said like, your writing is kicking ass and is so much improved and just kind of a nice shout out. She was proud of me that I, that I, um, up my game a bit and I've been working exceptionally hard at getting the writing to be uh, at the same level as what I would say the ideas and the concepts are and I think I'm pretty darn close which is pretty exciting so uh, as somebody who didn't do so well in school um, I, I, anytime anybody says like man you communicate so well and that I'm like Man, I want to give you the phone number to my English teacher so you could like call them up and be like, hey, you know that guy that you hassled? Anyways, so um, Love Them by Leaving Them, volume two, very soon. Super excited about it. And uh, we were strategizing all day today about some different ways, different approaches with it. And I think it's going to be, I don't want to use the term game changer, but I think it'll be a game changer. I think so. The first one has been a game changer as far as helping people psychologically understand what's going on with their dogs. I think this one is going to do that at an even, to an even deeper extent. So really exciting. Oh, uh, we've got T3 in July. Um, that almost always sells out and it's, it's already selling, um, very quickly. So we have a few spots left. Anybody who's interested in joining us, um, for T3 in July, there's only three T3s a year. We've already done LA. This will be the second one. After that, there's one more, and then that's it for 2019. Um, so if you want to learn how to become a dog trainer, how to build a business, how to become successful, how to, how to best serve clients, how to best serve yourself, how to create the life that you want, T3 is a really, really, really great place to go to build that foundation. So. Let's, from there, make a little bit of a departure and we're gonna jump into something that is important to me. Um, this is a, a, a comment that, that arrived when I, when I posted up that, <clears throat> that we were going to restart uh, Q&A Saturday and it's from a long time viewer. So there's some folks from Q&A Saturday that go back a long, long, long ways. People that have sent us gifts um, all sorts of treats and, and um, all sorts of just cool knickknacks and things like that. Um, Kathleen Ragsdale was somebody that has been with us for a very long time and she was in a, in a pretty challenging space with her dog. And I remember those, I remember those days because we, we, back in the day like that, there, there weren't a million questions and a lot of the questions came from the same people over and over again. And so we kind of progressed through their work with them. And um, we were able to help Kathleen really get a handle on her dog and the problem situation that she was having. And so she wrote a really, really special comment um, when I posted up that we'd be tackling this again. And so I'm gonna have Marta read that comment real quick and uh, she'll be doing so with a Polish, German, New Zealand accent. So um, subtitles will be rolling underneath this. And um, we will see about the subtitles. Okay, so make sure you project so they can hear you nice and clear. Okay. So Kathleen wrote, I remember many years ago meeting you and Laura on Facebook with my questions, with my pity and what I thought was a lost cause, paying for a private trainer with little or no results, thinking I had to give up Phoebe. With you two, life changed. Phoebe's my best friend. She still doesn't care for other dogs, and I am cool with that. But she can handle them. e collar, prong, and direction, knowing what I'm asking of her. No way I can say in words what you guys did for me. Phoebe may not be the perfect dog, but she's mine, and we work together. Life is good. Oh mm. yeah, with the good dog, best book ever. Okay, so here's where we cut away, so we don't have to have me crying, <laughs> crying on screen. <laughs> Um, Kathleen, thank you so much, and I'm so proud of you, and um, to be honest, it 
like all the information we give, any of this stuff, any of the videos from, from me or any other trainer really don't mean anything um, unless you take the reins and take the responsibility and put in the effort and create the changes. We can tell you all sorts of stuff and we tell lots of people plenty of things and they don't follow through and you've been somebody that's absolutely thrown down and done the work and created a reality that's um, a pretty touching beautiful reality and I'm super happy for you and I'm super proud and thank you so much for sharing that and I really felt like it was a great way to kick off Q&A Saturday yeah. from the old days tying it into the new days for any of you guys who haven't haven't been here who are new to our our our, our scene our situation um, you might be like what is this you know just some kind of dog training you know show um, but it was on for several years and we did 144 episodes um, and we dove into a lot of heavy duty topics and heavy duty detail um, with some really challenging situations and so being able to share this helps kind of connect the dots if you're not familiar with our work and um, and also it's just kind of a, a nice selfish thing because it, it touches my heart and makes me feel good. So thanks Kathleen and, and keep, keep kicking ass, thanks. So. Um, from there, uh, luckily I didn't like really. Like, I was close. Yeah, I know. I, was, I, I, I got a little watery, yeah. but I, I held yeah. it together. Um, let's jump into question number one. What can cool. you say? Question number one yes. on Instagram. <laughs> question is from JB Sweet fifty seven. How much time on a daily basis do you spend training each dog? What would you recommend for an owner, time wise? And when not training, is the dog in the kennel? Okay. Uh, JB Sweet 57 I wish that was my handle. Um, so our basic process, um, whether it's in LA or New Orleans, everything fluctuates to some degree. But the overall overriding blueprint is this. It's a structured walk, which is 30 to 40 minutes, something like that. No sniffing, no pulling, no marking, no targeting other dogs. Walk at heel, behave, almost said misbehave, that would be wrong. Behave <laughs> appropriately. And um, that's one, one piece of it. And then the rest of the actual training besides the walk is, is a 90 minute session. And it's a little bit different than what a lot of trainers um, what a lot of trainers recommend. A lot of trainers recommend very short sessions done, um, you know, over the course of the day, two, three, four sessions a day. So in my uh, journey of, of studying dog training, what I found was that there was a, a lot more value in longer sessions if done right, if done correctly. So there's a lot of times with dogs where you can do short sessions and you can tr kind of try and climb the mountain through challenges and problems and things like that and then you're like well it's been 15 minutes and you put the dog away and you don't get to the top of the mountain and then you bring them out and you start climbing again and you put them away and the same thing goes on and on and on or you can sorry my OCD there's dog here on the table or you you can work the dog through a program where you're actually able to push when you need to push when it's appropriate uh, and help the dog that might be stuck with a certain situation or stuck with a certain command or stuck with a certain fear or behavior whatever it might be and be able to use that extra time to help move up the mountain and actually get to the top and help the dog get over it. So that might sound a little bit nebulous and nuanced and complex, but it's really not. It's about ensuring that you have enough time to be able to move a dog through the process, whatever that process might be to best serve them. So for some dogs, it's very easy because they're very easy. For some dogs, they're very challenging, so you need that extra time. But along with that, whether they're challenging or not challenging, the way our program works and the, the reason it works for all sorts of different dogs is because that 90 minutes is broken up into action and non-action. So the action is typically whatever behavior you're training. 
you're training sit, you're training down, you're training place, you're training recall, you're training thresholds, you're training whatever. So that's the action. Then there's the stillness. And you don't want the action to be 45 minutes of action or 90 minutes of action. That's gonna burn the dog out, burn the dog's mind out. It's not going to help, it's not going to be beneficial. So what we end up doing is some kind of version of what a lot of trainers do, which is putting the dogs away after 15, 20 minutes of active work and then letting them, as they say, kind of like simmer and marinate and process in the crate. Here's what we find. You take those same dogs and you, because place is typically the first command we train in inside, you get a dog to learn how to hang out on place within the first 15, 30 minutes. And all of a sudden you've got a dog that not only knows that command from the active work, but then you're starting the duration work, which helps the dog start to pattern this behavior of, I can lay in place and I can start to ignore the world going on around me, which brings all of the reactivity and the typical kind of patterns to trigger, which means like, this just happened, cat just went by, mom just walked out of the room, whatever it might be, and I just react to it. Instead, you start patterning this, patterning this kind of meditative state, which is like, I'm in place, I'm in duration, I'm probably gonna be here for a while, I might as well relax. So that's really our program. It's very simple. It's, we've got a bunch of obedience commands that we're working through. We've got state of mind work that we're working through as well. And then sandwiched in between all that is duration and stillness. So if you can think about for your own life, because I know your question was like, well, what do, you, what do you do as an owner? If you can think about just applying the same concept, which is action, and stillness, action and stillness. And the action should be typically be 15, 20%. The stillness, 75, 80%. Of course it can fluctuate a bit, but that's what you're looking for. You're looking for the dog to really, like people, people can't wrap their heads around the value of duration work. They're finally starting to get it, but the value of duration work doesn't teach your dog to be a zombie. It doesn't teach your dog to like tune out and, and have no personality. It teaches your dog how to cope with what goes on in regular life and not feel it needs to be a part of every single aspect of that regular life and react to it, be triggered by it, feel some kind of stress or anxiety. They just lay there, they just hang out. And if you do it right, if you correct for any kind of inappropriate behavior and if you train the behavior correctly, the dog will just hang out in place, develop this very kind of casual, relaxed, nonchalant response to whatever goes on in the world. And then all of a sudden you've got a dog like guests come over and your dog like hangs out in place. And your guests are like, God, your dog's so calm and cool. And they'll probably say it's sad too. And that's the typical one. But they'll, they'll say like, wow, your dog's calm and cool. And you're like, yeah, you know? And they're like, how'd you get him like that? And like, well, we just practiced. And so if you practice duration work far more than you practice the active work, you have to practice the active work because you've got to get the dog to be able to understand how to, how to perform all the commands, but you can break it up. And I'm hoping I'm saying this clear enough. You can break it up at home in a fashion where you're focused on whatever active behavior you're trying to teach and then fold in a large amount of duration work, stillness, to where your dog learns how to also shut off, shut down, relax, and just be quiet and chill. And so that's, that's really the plan, and that, that's, that's the approach that we use. And instead of putting dogs away, we get this, this bonus effect, which is duration work and like enforced meditation which creates a completely different mindset for dogs and the dogs that go home end up being in a much different space than if they were just going through a program where obedience was the only priority. And that's what we see over and over and over again. Obedience, 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 obedience. Nobody works on like, how do you calm a dog down? Like not just telling him to down, not just having him heal, not just having him sit. Those are all just commands, but they put the dog on alert. They get the dog to do this, they get this, but they don't teach your dog how to just relax and calm down. So that's my best advice to you is to incorporate what we do because it works really well.
course, you have to find a way to fold it into your reality and, and make it work for your, your own regular life. But if you get creative, you'll figure it out. So that's it. How's that for a short answer? Ready? Fire. Ready for number two? Uh-huh. So, question number two is also from Instagram and is from Jackie Mudd. And the question is, how would TGD team get a small, fear-reactive dog by history with the emphasis on history, more comfortable with strangers approaching or being in his intimate space? He's fine with passing by, etc. Lots of basics covered with him, tons of structure, etc. He's okay with the intro. He is okay if the intro can take time and be governed by me, but not if the strange human takes a direct approach. I do advocate for our space. Humans. <laughs> they are always so yes, yeah. I do advocate for our space, but he can't stand it if they fall on baby talk and give lots of eye contact and rude, pushy body language. The dog was surrendered to me by previous owners two years ago. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take a little bit of, of exception with a couple of a couple of the things there and then dive in. So you're saying you're advocating for the dog, but yet you're saying like the dog doesn't do well with pushy um, baby talk, heavy duty body language, mm -hmm. pushing into the dog's space. If you're truly advocating for the dog, then none of that stuff goes down. So not to call you out, but kind of to call you out on that because we can, I think we can have very different perceptions of what advocating is. So for some people advocating is like, well, I just don't let people like, you know, do like, you know, bear hugs with my dog. And as long as they're not bear hugging, we're good. Um, and I know that's not what you mean, but here's an interesting story that I'll try and encapsulate exceptionally quickly. And that's Malu, who lives at uh, TGD Chatsworth, um, that uh, she's um, on Ree's dog. And she came from a facility where she was just kind of a guard dog, just let, let to do her own thing very fearful, very insecure, growling, snarling, all sorts of misbehavior around any stranger, anybody who she wasn't familiar with except for Henri. What did we do? We had her completely structured, top to bottom, from the time that she arrived because Henri adopted her, brought her into the house, <clears throat> put her in a crate in the small living room where a lot of clients and dogs pass through daily. Um, and what we didn't do is we didn't allow anyone to have any interactions with her, which sounds like the most counterproductive thing that you can imagine, except it wasn't, except for the fact that it created the exact opposite of what most people will think. So here's the, here's the thing where I think a lot of people miss the boat. They've got a dog who's fury, fearful, reactive, biting, whatever you want to call it, and they're trying to desperately build a bridge to get the dog to feel comfortable with human interactions, even though the dog's not. And so they'll try and do things where they, you know, have people hand food. Mm -hmm. because what could be bad about handing food to a dog? A shit ton could be bad. What I'd like to share with you is that with Malu, and she's not every dog, but she's a great example. And we've talked about it a lot at TGD because we've watched over the course of a year and a half, two years, what's, 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 how she's transformed and why, and we've really analyzed it, and that basically she was in a crate anytime she wasn't being worked, anytime she wasn't on a walk, anytime she wasn't on a hike, she was in a crate. It sounds like a really tough life, but she really enjoyed her crate. Um, we wouldn't let anybody go up to her crate. We wouldn't let anybody talk to her, like baby talk. We wouldn't let anybody come and bring her food. We wouldn't do any of the things that are typically accepted as the, 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 appropriate, the appropriate approaches to helping a dog that's unsure about people feel better about them. What did we do? We made sure that she was not allowed to growl bark, snarl, misbehave, be in any kind of negative state around people. So we managed her and, and directed her behavior 
to make sure that it was exactly right on the money. And then we did the same thing for people. We didn't allow, we didn't allow people, you want to go ahead? Yeah. Cookies are being delivered. Hey, you know me. To build a bridge to a dog that doesn't want a bridge built. And that bridge, even with good intentions, is typically done through trying to baby talk, sweet talk, touch, pet, share food, share treats, sit in front of a crate, get the dog to feel better. None of that stuff was allowed. And instead, what we did was basically just ignore her, let her take in the world, let her watch people come and go, come and go. And if she misbehaved, she growled, she got uncomfortable, she whined or anything that we didn't like, anything that was negative, we corrected. But we also didn't let anybody else do anything that would be any kind of pressure towards her. And what we found over time, and it did take some time, was that all of a sudden she started to feel very comfortable with people. She started, we, we were able to let her out of the crate when we had new interns over, friends, <laughs> guests, um, which are kind of the same thing. Um, whatever, whoever we might have had over, and she was curious and interested and going up to them and being safe, not being jumping and not being so weird. And that really was a byproduct of her learning that she could watch people and nobody would pressure her, no matter what. And so this whole concept of creating a bridge and creating a positive association and getting a dog to feel good about you simply because you're doing something good is something that needs to be completely reassessed. Because what ends up happening is that our perception of what's creating good oftentimes is pressure for dogs, which moves them backwards. So. To, to kind of tie this up and put a bow on it, if you're looking to get this biting, uncomfortable, nervous, insecure, small dog, relaxed, comfortable, and behaving well around humans, then you have to absolutely ensure two things. One, the dog is not allowed to misbehave around people that are behaving appropriately. And shouldn't, be, shouldn't misbehave no matter what, but, especially if anybody is behaving inappropriately. So growling, snarling, tension, staring, anything like that, that should be gone. But also at the same time, people should not be allowed to do any kind of baby talk, any kind of close up kind of pressure, any kind of food work, any kind of thing like that. And this is gonna rile a bunch of people up because they're like, food work is the great bridge. Is it? Not always. It can be for lighter dogs, for dogs that are curious, that are like, I'm unsure, but maybe I could like make this like connection with you. Dogs that are truly insecure, truly fearful, truly in a bad space, the, the food ends up being pressure. That desire for interaction from the human to the dog ends up being pressure. So to tie it up, I would say, teach your dog how to exist appropriately, teach the humans around your dog how to exist appropriately and have some very, very strict rules about that and be exceptionally patient and watch what happens over a long period of time because the animal that perceives humans having no ill intent and ill intent, even if they mean well, ill intent by pressuring them, if the, the animal that feels that and senses that and has that reinforced over and over and over again over time will start to feel like, ah, no big deal. I've seen that person a million times or I've seen a million different people a million different times and none of it matters. None of them come up and pressure me. So now maybe I'll come up and say hi. Now maybe I'll come up and like brush up against them. Now maybe I'll do something more proactive. It's flipping the script instead of, saying that the humans have to be the, pro the proactive ones, now we're letting the dogs be the proactive ones. And I don't mean not leading them, because we're still holding them accountable, but we're also holding the humans accountable. I hope that helps. Cool. Okay. Let's go to yeah. question number three. Yes. Ready? Mm-hmm. 
So question number three is from the Good Dog Facebook page, but mm -hmm. and it's from Robin Stauffer. This is your question. It's my question. This means I get to eat cookies while you read. <laughs> yeah, it actually says it actually says yeah. You better read fast because mm -hmm. you know what that means. Mhm. Mm so Robin says, "Yay! Very excited to watch some new Q and A videos. I got a new puppy a couple months ago." She's a miniature Aussie, 19 weeks old. I also have another mini Aussie that is just over two years old. Mm -hmm. My question for you is when I am training, I put my older one in place in the same room while I'm working with the puppy and he's great about staying in place and the puppy will stay focused on me. Mm -hmm. Should I be separating them more than this for training? I still take them on walks separate as the puppy is still learning leash manners and my older dog is very upset the entire time I am gone with the puppy. How would you recommend I teach my older one to relax and be calm when I leave with the puppy? Mm. So, Robin. Glad that's your question. <laughs> because it's Aussie? Mm -hmm. Just because it's, it's challenging. It is, it is. It's, a, it's an easy one for sure. Um, so Robin, with the training and your older dog being, being on place, I definitely think that you are able, if you are able to have your older dog on place, while you're training the puppy, that's super awesome. Yeah. I wouldn't try to make put the puppy away when the dog is out or have the, have your older dog away while you're training the puppy, having them around each other and being mindful to not go crazy all the time, but be respectful of whatever's happening in the house so that even though you're being excited with the puppy or training or doing whatever, that the older dog can still hold place it's going to be super valuable as the puppy grows up. You will have two adult dogs at some point who can both hold place even with other things happening around them. But it also teaches the puppy, as you said, to focus on you even though there's the buddy just around the corner on place who he probably wants to play with. There's a body? A buddy. Like, oh, a buddy. Like okay. A, like a playmate. I don't know if it's like a cadaver dog or something no. like that. Okay. Just I check. hope not. Just check. Let me know. So yes, yeah, super great for the puppy and for the older dog. So I will definitely keep that going. And when it comes to the walk and your older dog getting upset when you leave, <laughs> my first question would be if your older dog is in a crate when you leave because if the older dog is just in about, out and about. If the older about. dog, <laughs> yes, go ahead. If the older dog is just out and about as you leave with your puppy. It might be a bad idea to have him in a crate where he can, where he can't wander around and get himself all anxious and wound up. And then maybe you can practice it that you pretend to leave with the puppy, have the e-collar on your older dog, then step outside the house as if you would go for your walk, pretend you're going to leave, close the door, and then listen for for your dog, or set up a camera, or have the window open, whatever works best for you. And if he makes any noises, you can correct the e collar from outside mm -hmm. just so he gets to learn to be calm and quiet as you leave with the puppy. So that would be my recommendation for that. So if you already have the dog in the crate, then just step number two is listening for him whining or whatever he's doing. So you're it's concerned upset. that maybe there's not a crate involved, maybe the dog's just wandering around? Yeah, 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 yeah. because even. It, it makes it much easier, I think, to have the dog in the crate, nice and calm and structured. Explain to them why that might be the opposite if the dog wasn't crated. So if the dog isn't crated and you were to do the same thing to correct when he's out and about, he can still get himself frantic and wound up, look out of the windows, bark at the door, where in the crate there's only so much he can move and it creates more calmness, it creates boundaries, instruction, direction. Can I interrupt? It, it, yeah. it just a, a cool thing to think about. The crate not only limits freedom, but it limits options. Yes. Which yeah. is almost the same thing, but it's a good way to look at it. The, the more options you remove, the less anxiety, like I think I always use the same example. How many people have been at a restaurant with a menu that's like 400 yes. pages long yes. and you're like, ah! It's the same thing with the dog. You walk out of the house and your dog's got 400 million different options. That's a lot of options. 400 million options to, to, to try versus being in the crate, which is like, well, I could sit here, I could whine, I could bark a little bit, or I could just lay down and go to sleep. Yeah. 
And I think that's something people forget is that by re and removing options, you actually remove anxiety. And if the older dog is being upset, whining, barking or whatever it is that he's doing, might also be a good indication of where he stands with you relationship wise and emotionally that now you're leaving uh -oh. him you're leaving him behind and he disagrees with that because he wants to be by you so it might be a good idea to even start implementing the crate to create the separation to where he learns to be on his own a little bit more because it has just been two of you and with a new dog that makes it always gets a little bit harder are you implying that there may be a bit of a dependency kind of thing going on maybe a little okay and what happens from that and tear up couches <laughs> and tear up shoes maybe and neurotic howling. dogs yes yeah yeah so stuff that you don't want basically initially that stuff can feel very connected yeah very fun very loving um, very much like it's me and my dog until it becomes wow I need to try and do something independent of my dog and my dog becomes a complete wreck because I'm no longer there yeah. so and I strangely just wrote a post about that today so maybe you write your post maybe you're, you're sneaking in <laughs> okay cool so nice work thank you what's the next question next question number four is from the good dog facebook mm -hmm. and it's oh so it's actually so question number four is actually tied up together by two people because it's in the same same um area same, same vein same, same vein yeah same vein okay. yeah say that so that, that's what it is so it's from two people i can feature all sorts of wrong words and tell the right words i'll google it after the show okay and find out okay so I'm, I'm not lying to you here though <laughs> we will find out <laughs> so from kinsley joy lagen and alexis wilkinson and mm -hmm. first of all kinsley is saying as a balanced dog trainer what are some good ways techniques questions to screen potential clients mm -hmm. if you had one piece of self-development life advice you could give what would it be thanks with three hearts okay and alexis is saying Love that you're back at it. My question is, who do you follow, listen to for self-development and what are some great books to read? I know you have kind of answered before, but I can't find it. Okay. I like these questions. Okay, let's see if we can tie these together really quick. So, Kenzie's first question was, repeat, reread re the very first, mm -hmm. the first um, Kinsey? part of Kenzie's, yeah. As a balanced dog trainer, what are some good ways, techniques, questions to screen potential clients? So, when you mm -hmm. get mm -hmm. new clients, how do you find out if they suit your program? One word. Want to guess at it? I mean, go ahead. <laughs> there's too many. There's too many ideas that I right, I'm right. Good. With. It's too treacherous. Transparency. So. Were you going to say that? No. Okay, you can't claim that. You're like, yeah, I was going to say transparency. So. I wish. So her question was, what was, say it again, what was the. Um, screening new clients. Yeah, for screening new clients, the best thing that you can possibly do is be incredibly transparent. And when I say transparent, I don't just mean like, hey, here's me in my pajamas, like with my cats on the couch. Like, that's not the transparency you need. What I'm talking about is, tools, programs, your approach, um, your results, showing videos, um, the, the, the entire, and did I say prices? I don't think it said prices. No, you didn't. Prices, everything that you can put up for your client to digest that is true, that is about who you are, how you train, and what's involved in your training is the very best way. It's a very, it's the very best filtering mechanism. So basically, if you think about it, if you're a customer, client, prospective client, goes to your website um, or your social media, but let's say website especially, and sees, okay, you're you're sweet, kind, and and very straightforward, and you share that 
I use these tools. Um, I use this kind of training approach, and here are the reasons why. Um, these are our prices for these programs. And here are the videos showing the results of this work on a variety of dogs. Now, you do that, and what you're gonna get is you're gonna get a lot of filtering, and you're gonna lose some clients, and there's a lot of people who disagree with this. There's a lot of trainers and trainer gurus out there, trainer teachers, trainer um, mentors that will tell you, no, 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 get the client on the phone, get build some trust, which is the, like the biggest oxymoron bullshit, like build some trust by manipulating them. Yeah, no, how about instead build some trust by actually sharing the real thing. So my big issue with this is that they're trying to get people on the phone to build trust, which means basically create some sense of obligation, and then you do the song and dance once they know who you are, and you tell them, okay, so I use these tools, I use this approach, and sheepishly, I mean, here's our pricing, you know, but it's negotiable and, and all that stuff. Or you can just be very transparent and be like, here's everything that we do and why, without being a hard ass, without being rude, without being, without being overly harsh or creating any kind of, um, not friction, but pushback from your client. Instead, make it something that's a welcoming, I, I know for me as a client or a customer of any, any product, service, if I go to their website and there's all this transparency, here's what we do, here's why we do it, here's the pricing, here's what it looks like, I'm like, man, sign me up. Now, instead, if they're like, we do great work, we're amazing, we're special, we create magic, call for more information and pricing. You've already lost me, because I know you're full of shit, because I know you only want to get me on the phone for one reason, and that's to try and sell me. I don't want to be sold to, I want to sell myself. So if you're really smart, Kenzie, I think, is there a name? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If you're really smart, you'll teach people how to sell themselves by sharing the right kind of content um, and the right kind of transparency to where people go, that's who I want. And, and don't forget that within the pricing and the tools and the approach, also an incredibly important component is who you are. By projecting and not bullshitting, but actually being and presenting who you are in videos and pictures and, and texts and blogs or however you're going to go about it, you can actually help people understand more who you are and make a better, a better informed decision about whether you're a good fit for them. So that's the first part. I had to cover that because it's, it's too juicy. So one piece of self-development advice, this one's easy, influences. My book, Closing the Gap, it's the chapter I open with. And it's because unlike what a lot of people think about when they think about personal development, um, typically the most common first step is thought. The, the first step is like, get your thoughts together and then everything emanates from thoughts. Mm -hmm. But what people don't realize is that before you have the thoughts, you have the influences that create the thoughts. And so if you take one step back further and you start to become ruthless with, with your influences, I mean, and you treat them as they are, like life and death, because they are, to, to how your life is going to actually proceed. And I don't mean necessarily you're going to die, but I mean like the quality of your life is life and death, then the influences are the most critical components of that. And if I had to say one thing that changed my life was I got rid of everything negative, and I mean everything, Facebook, Instagram didn't even exist back then. Facebook, um, even phone calls, um, any, anybody in my world that was delivering anything nasty, negative, toxic, they were gone. And it was ruthless and it was hard for a lot of people and there was a lot of pushback. Um, and then what I did was bring in a ton of really amazing influences which were 
books, speakers, friends, whatever. I was just incredibly strict, uh, ruthless is a better word, about who I would let in and who I would not let in. And that absolutely changed who I was from the ground up. And once you have the consistent kind of propulsion of positive, and I don't mean positive in just like the easy mamby-pamby way, but positive influences that are pushing you in a direction, they will actually start to cultivate the thoughts that you think, the actions that you take, and also the character bar that you set for yourself. Because if you're around really great people, they'll set a different bar for your character of what's appropriate and acceptable behavior. And all of a sudden you start acting like a different person. And if you pick good people, you'll start acting like really good people. And conversely, if you don't, if you, if you have friends and, and, and even toxic family members and things like that, that leads you astray, then you're going to move in that direction. So that's my number one, and, and I'm telling you. If you wouldn't mind me adding Go this. Go ahead, yeah, add. Talking about influences, I think the biggest one are Facebook friends that aren't, aren't really friends. Do you know what I mean? Someone late, who late you on. met like, someone you met like five years ago somewhere, mm -hmm. like, hey, let's be Facebook friends. But all they share is super negative stuff mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you just get sucked into it and it becomes the majority of your Facebook feed and that's just basically what you look at all day rather than being people who you like really trust who have great thoughts to put across and put out there and yeah and yeah and the fact that here's the thing which which plays off of what you just said is that we like to think we're stronger than we are yes we like to think that, oh, those Facebook posts that come down the don't pike, affect nah, we don't even pay attention. The reality is they do. They have some kind of effect on your state of mind, your mindset, your beliefs. And next thing you know, you're posting something that you're not so proud of, or better yet, without even saying anything, you're thinking thoughts about people that you're not so proud of because you've been inundated with all sorts of negative comments and influences so that's that and so now moving on to uh, the second question which is from Alexis Wilkinson mm -hmm. do you want to read that? so who do you follow or listen to for self-development and what are some great books to read well 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 can I some chocolate sugar? no thank you Do you want a tissue? Hmm? Do you want a tissue? No, I'll be good. I'm just gonna rub it on my hand. Right. Have a look inside there. What? In the back. There's nothing in there. No. Okay, never mind. Never mind. We'll, we'll send him a note to say send nap napkins okay. next time. Okay, so who are the people that I look to that influence me that have been the most important? So here's an interesting piece of this. And that's, that's the fact that where I was when I first started this work, back when I was like 37, 38, I'm 51 now, right? Um, they were very different people. And they were very important, critical people at that point. There were people that were, when I was in this space, I needed them. And then as I got a little bit up here, then I needed some different people. And as I got up here, I needed different people. So my standards, not that anybody down there that was, that, that was helping me move were not valuable, but what ended up happening was my standards were being raised and raised and raised and raised and raised. And through that process, I started even with the, the, uh, influences and people that I looked to started to shift and change and it, it was fascinating to watch people that had been like like really important to me people that I was like oh my god you gotta read this book and and it's not that the, these books aren't valuable anymore it's just that for my personal progress they lost their their kind of their mojo or their interest for that for that time so what I'll do is 
and you'll have to remind me, mm -hmm. is I will PM Alexis my book list. Okay. Because I have the full book list. And it will include some of these people, but not all of them, because who I'm following, checking out, and studying from month to month pretty much changes. But th these would be like kind of foundational books um, and, and, and such that, will, that would be helpful. So here's who I got for you. Seth Godin, his free blogs, like maybe the best thing going and it doesn't cost you anything and it arrives in your email every day and he doesn't ask you for anything. He just gives you amazing freaking wisdom every day. He also has a million books that are fantastic for not just marketing and business and things like that, but books like um, The Icarus Deception, which are, are all about taking risk, which are all about like, which are all about pushing yourself and taking chances. Um, audiobooks like um, Leap Before You Look, I think is what it's called. And it's all about risk taking and it's all about putting yourself out there and it's all about generosity and it's all about what could happen if you actually put yourself out there and shared your work and your voice. So Seth, that's amazing. Gary V kind of goes without saying if anybody knows who he is. Gary is uh, somebody I've followed for close to 10 years. It was actually featured in his last book, which was uh, phenomenally um, special for me to be, uh, to be included. Um, and Gary is a, is a very unique, is a very unique person when it comes to the business world, how he handles his business, how he handles biz, uh, marketing, how he handles branding, how he handles a million different things. And if there's anything that I got from um, Gary early on was the power of personal branding. And luckily I read that book, Crush It, back in like 2008 or 2009. So it was quite a while ago. And that concept of personal branding has served me very, very, very well. And I'll explain that later in another question. Um, JP, Jordan Peterson. Some folks, I mean, he can be a very uh, polarizing figure. Some folks can't deal with him. Some folks don't like his politics. Some folks don't like his religious um, overtones. Some folks, whatever. Um, he's an incredibly bright man. And if you look to find what he shares, that is, if you watch his YouTube lectures, and you actually watch them with an open mind and you pay attention and they don't affect some fairly massive change in the way you view the world and think about things, then, hey, he's not for you and I'll cross him off my list. But I think you'll find that you enjoy him considerably. Um, so JP, TS, Thomas Sowell. Thomas Sowell has got, what, is he 89, 88, something like that? Um, he's an economist, but also um, incredibly insightfully, deeply uh, tuned into cultural, social behavior, what drives behavior, what's really, like his whole thing is really about getting to the core of truth um, rather than just accepting what is commonly accepted as truth because we hear it so much and and also breaking apart a lot of um how do i put it common commonly accepted arguments um ways of of leveraging certain things to try and get people to feel like whoa you know i i don't know what i'm talking about he's he's fantastic at breaking things down and helping people see the other side of the story that typically isn't seen and and it's all backed up with data that's where he gets everybody because everybody else is like well blah 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 and then thomas is like yeah but here's the data on this and he's been he's got I don't know, he's got 30 something books out he's a fellow at the hoover institute and he will challenge the way you think and believe and react to 
information about our current culture and and past culture and I'm trying to see if I can get this right because it's so important but what what leads to what and that's really maybe that the best way in a very simplistic way to put it so many people see this and this has caused this this has caused this this has caused these people to struggle this has caused these people to have little this has caused this to become the or this has caused crime this has caused poverty this is and he will lay out a very, very, very compelling argument based on statistics and information why that isn't the case. And if you're not ready to be challenged, he's a bad one to check out. Um, and he's also really funny. T.S. Jim Rohn. Jim Rohn is basically the, the blueprint, the architect. Um, he's the one who really, really changed my life. Um, I always recommend for anybody who's looking for kind of a launching pad of, of personal development to, to kind of get the overview, the, 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 the real framework that, that you can move through and have kind of the whole underpinning of what you need. Um, Jim's Art of Exceptional Living 6 CD program is perhaps one of the most profoundly effective and affecting resources out there and it's inexpensive. And if you're really, really in a tight spot financially, if you just type that in to YouTube, you can see most of the program, if not all of the program. Beware that it's done in the 80s and hairdos mm -hmm. and clothing and, and such mm -hmm. are, are, are different than, uh, than what you might expect now. But his message, man, the guy is just genius. And he literally, I probably listened to his, his six CD program a, hundred, a few hundred times. And um, it absolutely changed the, com it absolutely changed everything about how I live my life. And so I can't say enough about Jim. Uh, from Jim, there's Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman was uh, another economist like Thomas Sowell. Um, he won the Nobel Peace Prize, I think I wanna say. Um, and he was instrumental in changing a lot of people's beliefs about the free market and how markets work and, but like Thomas Sowell, also how humanity works. And um, he's a brilliant mind. Some people will disagree with this politics, um, but it's pretty hard to disagree with what he's presenting, even if you're not in complete agreement with what he's presenting, he's doing it in such a kind, gentlemanly, civilized fashion that you can go, oh, that makes sense. And that part, no, that doesn't make so much sense. And, and just take what's good and leave what you don't, uh, don't dig. Um, but boy, like watching him back in the day on, on YouTube, dealing with like and then we're talking about the olden days, like dealing with angry hippies that are like, you're the man and we're going to take you down. And he's just like calm as a, is it calm as a cucumber? No. Ca no. Cool as a cucumber. Cool as a cucumber. Cool as a cucumber. <laughs> and calm as one too. And um, just basically just runs runs through answers and responds to people and, and helps people understand what's going on. Um, anything else? Let's see. Brene Brown. Brene Brown was uh, fantastic. Anybody who's dealing with any kind of baggage, which is probably all of us. Um, <clears throat> Brene, as far as she does a lot of work on shame and uh, that's kind of her bag. And um, I know for, especially for females, um, she seems to connect really, 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 really heavily. Um, she, she connected for me, but it's, it's written definitely in a more female centric kind of fashion. And I think that um, if you are a female and you're looking to find some help um, to work through issues, shame and disempowerment and victimization and things like that, she can be extreme, extremely helpful. And she was, like I said, helpful to me as well. Um, last one, Larry Wingett. Um, that's one of the guys from the olden days. And Larry, uh, I still recommend Larry's book um, your children are your own fault as 
yeah. my yeah. favorite dog training book of all time. So if you want your ass kicked and you want the truth and you don't want any like sugar coating, Larry Wingate is your dude. So anyways, that's, that's that. That's that. That's okay. that. Yeah. And you also PM her. Uh, oh, yeah. Podcast. Yeah. So um, uh, I will PM if you remind me. I will PM I her sure. my book list. Okay. So, question number five mm -hmm. is from Good Vibes K9 on Instagram. And the question is Any tips you wish you would have gotten right before you opened your board and train facility? Mm -hmm. I'm about to open my board and train and any advice will be much appreciated. We are clearly extremely successful and we use an almost identical training method. Well, well, well. What do you say? Okay, so I'm gonna answer this a little bit differently. I'm not gonna say, um, what. I'm not gonna share what tips I wish I would have gotten. I can't think of really any tips except not to be stupid. Those would have been the best tips, mm -hmm. but those are, those, those, those are general. Universal. Those are universal in general. What I am going to share are the things that have been most helpful for me, and I hope they help you. So, start small and don't expand until you're bursting. That's been mm -hmm. an absolute foundational bedrock approach for TGD. And so, started in a small apartment, then moved to a little bit of a bigger house, then moved to a considerably bigger house with property, and same thing has gone on in New Orleans. And it's basically, we start small, and as things expand, they get bigger and bigger, and you're like, I don't think we've got enough space here. I don't think that we've got enough team here. I don't think we have enough resources to be able to best serve the dogs and best serve the people or the clients. Let's adapt, let's adjust, let's add some more. And that means growth. So number one, I think people expand way too quick. Mm -hmm. I think people get like, wow, I'm gonna open a facility or I'm gonna open this or I'm gonna create this. And they don't realize that you can easily move too fast and you can find yourself in a really tough spot. And one of, one of the things that have worked for me and you said I've been, you know, that I've clearly successful, um, which is very kind of you to say, um, but the method has been just moving fast, like trying to kick butt, but not saying like, we need a 50,000 square foot facility so we can do this and this. No, it's like, we're here, wait till this is bursting, boom, then we get the next spot. Wait till this is bursting, boom, then we get the next spot. When I say next spot, I mean both space and team. So that's super important. Um, let's see, um, I really recommend that you have a mission behind your business and your brand. And when I say that, uh, I think it can lose a lot of people if you're just out there training dogs and everybody says the same thing, I just want to help dogs and people, like, that's great. And I'm not going to dismiss that. But there are bigger, I would say, more important, more valuable, more critical things that we can be tackling out there and make part of our mission. And so if helping dogs and people are your mission, then define it more clearly, define it more in a hardcore fashion, like what do I wanna do and how do I wanna make that happen? How do I wanna best serve dogs and owners? And then define the crap out of that so you can be like, here's what I'm doing. I'm simplifying, I'm getting rid of this, I'm getting rid of this, I'm getting rid of this. We're only gonna tackle this, this, and this to make sure that we best serve our clients and the dogs within our program. So that would be a mission. And then what would happen is all your content, because we'll talk about content, all your content and all of your brand information would be infused with that stuff because that would be your mission. You would be telling people, hey, this is what we're about. And not like, hey, this is what we're about, but you would be putting that into the copy and you would be putting that into your content 
and you would be showing like, yep, so here we are doing this command, this command. We don't do fancy this, 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 and this because our clients really aren't looking for it. What we do focus on is calm, relaxed, well-behaved, good mindset, whatever it might be. So for TGD, there's a few different missions, but one of our biggest missions is our, uh, to help spread the information about tools, strategies, approach, and mindset, which might sound like a lot, but like I really, really, really work hard at pushing back against the stuff where people are saying, these tools are dangerous, these tools are bad for dogs, these tools are doing, you know, they're, they're detrimental to dogs, um, you don't need to train this way, um, all these different things. And then what ends up happening is all my content, all my brand flavor has this behind it without it beating me over the head. I don't wanna beat anybody over the head and be like, you gotta do it this way. And if you're not training this way, you suck. And I mean, then that's, that's a very crappy brand message and it's a very crappy brand mission. But putting information out there and educating people, like the part, the part that, that I struggle with so much is that I hear people say, well, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to create for, for content. And it's like, if you have a mission, it's a piece of cake because you wake up every day and, and you read some of the comments, you read something else and you're like, it triggers your mission. You're like, man, there's more of that stuff. Mm. Let me see what I can create. Let me see what I can share. Like I said, if simplicity is your mission, then it's like, let me show, because here's a bunch of trainers that are saying that only this kind of training is adequate training or is professional training. Only if a dog can awfully shield next to you and only if a dog can like awfully shield and stare at your eyes and only if a dog can do like, a running down stay at a hundred yards is the dog fully trained. And you're like, mm, that's not for me. But I want a dog to be able to walk nice. I want a dog to be able to recall on command. And I want a dog to be able to lay in place and not hassle the owners. That would be content that would be mission oriented. So that's a super important one. And it's, it's an easy one that can be missed. I see most, most trainers missing it. And when people wonder how I manage to create so much content, that's how I manage to create so much content because I wake up every day and the mission is like somebody runs the crank and I'm like, yes, here's the mission. So that's super important. Um, content, if you're gonna try and create any kind of impact, any kind of change in the way people view things, which we're talking about mission, if you're going to try and create a brand, if you're going to try and get the word out about what you do if you're not going to just resort to old school tactics of like, here's how we advertise, here's you know calls to action, here if you enter your email, we'll get back to you, how about a free consult, how about a demo in the park, how about some other bullshit? No, instead create content and let the content do the selling for you so clients are gravitating towards you rather than you trying to pull them in by like, look how good we are, look how good we are. Like, see this dog healing and like, look, look, he can jump through hoops of fire and, and all this bullshit. Instead, show what you can do, leave out the hoops of fire, unless it's really amazing. Um, show what you can do and let the content do the talking for you. And when I say content, I mean a lot of it needs to be results oriented. If you're taking the time to document a bad dog coming in, I don't mean bad like he's a bad dog, I mean a, a badly behaved dog coming in, totally a wreck, you videotape that, 30 seconds of it, and then you videotape the process of working through those problems with the dog and people get to go on that journey with you, which is something we just did with that dog poop, right? Mm -hmm. And we did, I don't know, like... Almost like every day. Yeah, like tw Almost probably got 20 day. different like, you know, updates, something like that. And what it allowed people to do was get invested in the story, allowed people to see at the beginning, oh my God, he looks shut down, he looks unhappy, he doesn't look like he's enjoying training. You're putting pressure on a prong collar, what a poor dog, there was all this horrible feedback. But I knew that if we kept doing updates, people would start to see this. Mm. 
right? And that was the mission once again. And so this training of this dog ended up being a story that not only helped inspire hope for people, um, benefited our business, but, but also showed people what the actual training process can look like and that it can start off messy and that it can start off not looking great and that dogs can be shut down, dogs can be unhappy and dogs can be stuck. And then if you do your job right, they can move out of it and they can turn into well-behaved, balanced, happy dogs that didn't look so good three weeks ago or four weeks ago. But that's, that's, the, that's the value of content. Doing content right absolutely is a game changer and um, that will build a brand. And I know I touched on that. I'm gonna just hit it one more time. If you're not building a brand, you're just doing a dog training service and there's a big difference. A dog training service, there's a multitude of them out there and that means that you're in competition with a multitude of dog training businesses. If you put content out there, if you build a brand, if you help people see what differentiates you, if you become an expert in your field by being an expert and by being generous and by sharing all of this stuff, you become somebody that's elevated to a different place rather than here's your neighborhood dog trainer who may be talented but like doesn't do any work as far as showing anything and here's you who is just as talented but shows all the work you do, who are people gonna call? They're gonna call, they're gonna email the, this, this person here because this is the person that they've seen, that they've got comfortable with, that they trust, that they see the results, that all this stuff comes together. And without building that, you're, you're really putting yourself in a, into a place of struggle. The other part of brand building is that it gives you, it gives you lateral movement. And that means you can do all sorts of other things, which is what I've done, which is creating other products, which is creating books, which is creating seminars and workshops and DVDs and things like that. So brand is everything. And it's probably the thing that's most missed and least talked about in the dog training world. So if you take anything away from this, take this away. If you're wondering like, why are you successful, Sean? That's why, because I learned that lesson a long time ago and I haven't deviated from it yet. And I got that from Gary way back in the day, Gary V talking about personal brand. And what I did was I, I, I combined personal brand and business brand. I put them together and they both live kind of cohabitate and you see some of my real regular life and then you see dog training life and I put them both together. And what that does is creates this thing where you've seen it, people show up at the house and they're like, oh wow, man, this is just like in the videos. And you know, or people wanna like, hey, will you sign my book? Or, hey, can I get a hug? Or those are things that the dog trainer down the street that doesn't put anything out, doesn't get. And when you have people in that space of like, I want you because I've watched so much of your work and, and I feel so connected to you. They're in a very different emotional space and commitment space and investment space to do the work that you're looking for them to do to be successful. So I, I could go on for hours about this, but I won't any more than I have. But brand building is the biggest thing that's missed. And Content creation is a huge part, content creation with a mission behind it is a huge part of how you build your brand. So, and then just to close this out, study more than dog training. 99% <clears throat> of my posts are not stimulated by dog training stuff. I don't follow dog trainers. I don't watch dog trainers. There's a couple of friends I watch occasionally. Other than that, I don't watch any dog trainers. I'm not looking to get my information from dog trainers. I'm not looking to get my content information from dog trainers. The reason why my stuff might feel different is because I get it from other places. I get it from people like we talked about, like JP and Thomas Sowell and Milton Friedman and, and Jim Rohn and all these different people. And I find the parallels between what they're sharing and what can work with dog training. And I don't just force them together, they have to work. But um, I just know that most dog trainers are heavily stuck in dog trainer land. And it's a pretty boring place.
place to be if you're going to create content. You're going to be like, here's how we train place. And people are going to be like, that's great. There's 4,000 place videos. Now, doesn't mean don't do a place video, but you got to dig a little deeper if you're going to actually have an impact and have something profound happen for people. So it, it'll also make you a better business owner. It'll make you a better dog trainer. It'll make you a better communicator with your team. It'll make you better with your clients. It'll make you better across the board. So do not just focus on dog training or you will suck wind. Okay. Um, I already talked about build a brand and then last thing, and, and I kind of hinted at this already, which was forget fancy, just do what works, just do what helps. Get rid of all the stuff that all this dog training bullshit out there is saying like you have to have dogs looking a certain way and they've got to be trained a certain way and if, if they don't reach this, this certain level, it's bullshit training. If they've got to use the tools, it's bullshit training. If, if your clients can't get off the tools or if your clients, you know, are whatever it might be, it's bullshit training. There's all of these messages out there that are looking, that are ego, ego based, egocentric messages that are meant to make other dog trainers feel like crap rather so they don't go out and put themselves out in the world. It's, it's, it's meant to kind of like be social pressure and squeeze you down and squeeze you down and squeeze you down. So my thing is like, we just embrace it. We do simple stuff. We do great stuff, but we do simple stuff. We don't teach dogs tricks or behaviors that they don't need because they don't work in the real world. The client doesn't need that. What the client needs are simple skills, simple tactics, simple strategies that they can put into use in real life in order to have a successful living arrangement with their dogs. And uh, the trainers that forget that tend to struggle and owners really, 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 really don't dig that kind of training interaction. Owners really love trainers that are like, I get you, I know what real life is like. You got kids, you come home, you got all this going on, you don't have time to do like three hours of dog training, but you can do this. You can put your dog in place while you're cooking dinner, and you can do this. You can like, you know, call your dog around during commercials, and you can do this, and all of a sudden they're like, oh wow, you, you're actually practical, and, and you care about what I'm doing, and, and you care about how my life looks. And um, so that would be my last piece of advice for that. So how was that for a nice long? Back in the game. I had a lot to say. I've been waiting for two years. Yep. I'm going to close out with this. Do you have anything to say? No, apart from that I enjoy everything and it's good to, to see this side of things. It's good to see it back? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So the last thing I'm going to close on is folks, you need to stand up. This goes for owners. This goes for trainers. There are people out there working day and night to remove your ability to be able to use certain tools and to be able to use certain training approaches. And everybody's, I won't say everybody, a lot of people are in la la land. A lot of people are in denial. A lot of people are like, ah, it'll never happen. But tools are being made illegal in many countries. And it's not because they're bad tools. It's because the people with the very loud voices that are very well organized with a lot of money behind them are able to push forward and owners and trainers are staying quiet, which gives them carte blanche to move forward and get what they want, which is like, what, how many places in Australia are, are e collars and prongs illegal? I, mean, I don't know how many, but too many. Yeah. Well, the fact that most, there are, yeah. most, most of them are. I um, think all of the East, maybe. Yeah. Um, Europe. Almost uh, every uh, country in almost Europe. Almost every country in Europe. Um, prongs and e-collars. Yeah. Um, At least like Western Europe. Yeah. In the UK, it's only Wales. So if anybody tries to tell you that it's it's all of the UK. But even if it's in the if, even if it's legal in the UK, like to even find someone who works with e-collars is so hard. So it doesn't even matter if they're legal or not. If no one is okay to use them because they're being so bullied and so shamed and harassed and get death threats that no one uses them. Yeah. So so Marta touches on a really good point, which is that 
there are a lot of trainers over there that know better, that know how to use these tools, yeah. but have been so pressured and, and so scared into silence that they won't even share on their websites or maybe even on phone calls or in phone calls that they use these tools. Maybe after like three or four dates with a client, they're like, yeah. okay, you know, I, we're, we're really struggling with media. this, you know, da, da 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 we can try and get into this. So here's the thing, guys. There's huge organizations working day and night to try and get rid of your ability to be able to choose which tools you use and which kind of training you use. You may think if you're in the States, hey, we're being clear. There was stuff in Florida that went down, what was it last year? Got like this close to prong collars being made illegal. Um, I've heard word that there's some stuff in Colorado where they're trying to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So don't think that you're safe. Don't think it's all over. They are going to push and push and push. And here's the thing, your silence is their license. Your silence, not saying anything, not standing up, not being like, this is bullshit, is their license to steamroll you and your rights and ability to use these, these tools. And eventually, if people stay quiet, if people stay mousy, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I get really, really amped about this because it's like I'm watching so many trainers and they'll PM me and they'll send comments, you know, back and forth and they'll be like, yeah, but it's going to really affect my business so I don't say anything and, and so I'm just kind of on the low down with it and my whole thing is like, guys, you think it's bad now? You think you're struggling now to be able to use these tools? Wait till they're completely fucking illegal. Mm -hmm. Wait till these people have all the power to dictate who gets to use them, how it's regulated. Then you'll see how your business is truly affected. So we can wait and be patient and civilized and nice and quiet and watch what happens and end up in a very bad space. Or we can actually stand up and do something about it. And if you're an owner and you've had good experience with these tools, have some guts share it with people that are asking questions. You don't have to go out there with a the sandwich board and be like, prong callers for life. But if people need help, you can share that. You can not be ashamed that you use a prong caller. If somebody harasses you on the street or says like, why do you use that? You can stand your ground and be like, I use it because it works. I use it because it's helped me have the best walk with my dog in my life. Why do you use an e-collar? Because I want to have freedom with my dog. I want my dog to be able to walk without being reactive. I want all this stuff. So no apologies. And the same thing goes for trainers. Like trainers have to go out there and be like, I use these tools because of this, this, and this. Explain to people why you use them without apologizing, without being in this space of, of silent, oppression and fear because you're going to be nailed by these people. I'm just telling you, if you go out there, you do your thing and, and you speak your mind, you speak your truth, we've got a real shot at pushing back against this. And if we don't, we've got a real shot of losing all of the abilities to be able to use these tools. So on that happy note, we're going to get out of here. Thank you for having Q and A me. Saturday. I was gonna. I was like, ah, Deb's gonna teach you the Q and A Saturday number one forty four. One more time. Q and A Saturday number one forty five is out of here, guys. Thank you so much. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. We'll talk to you guys soon in a month.